So taking us through to the next session, and this is Unity in a Global Pandemic, and we will have insights from across the globe, insights from Canada, insights from Turkey, and insights from Malaysia on how they've handled the pandemic. So I would like to introduce the panelists next. We have Professor Musa Nordin, who has come and joined us all the way from Malaysia. So thank you so much. I know it's extremely late where you are now. So thank you so much. Um, and he is a consultant pediatrician at KPJ um, Damansara Hospital. And then we have um, Dr. Mohammed Khan, who is an academic respirologist in Toronto. And then President of BIMA, Professor Ihsan um, Karaman, who is also the president, who founder of Doctors Worldwide. So over to you, Professor Nordin. Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. My, my dear sister and uh, Professor Ihsan and Professor Muhammad Khan and uh, my dear brothers and sisters in, uh, in BIMA and everywhere else where you might be. This is the first bit, yeah? I thought that was supposed to be a first question and this is my first response. I'm allowed five minutes, I think. And this just shows the problem that is besetting the ummah. Malaysia is suffering its third wave, just like our brothers and sisters in the United Kingdom is or are. And this has been the response of our young doctors in the Islamic Medical Association uh, of Malaysia. Yeah, this was when we sent them off to Sabah, where we had a huge uh, outbreak of uh, COVID-19. Yeah, and these are some of the great things that they did. This is the hospital that did not do C-section for the past 14 years. Our guys went there. That's an anesthesiologist in the dark blue. He started and trained them to do the first C-section without having to send them across to a, a major hospital. And this is a huge uh, Air Force carrier. This is the belly that is going to bring all the stuff across uh, the South China Sea to Sabah. And that guy is the anesthesiologist that would continue with the C-section and the general anesthesia in, in that, that afflicted area. We target the impoverished, the marginalized, and these are the prisoners in one of the states in the north of Malaysia. And this is my, 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 my what I would say, to the youth, because I remember the works of Imam Hassan al-Banna and Abu al-Ala Maududi. Look at all the young guys. I am probably the only geriatric in the team. And look at the amount of things that they have distributed all over Malaysia. We are about, what, 30, 30 million people? And this is the Sabah response. If you see that we were doing rapid tests in 12 islands. No, we had to take the boat something like two and a half hours to these islands. We brought across our biosafety cabinets with the RTK antigen. We could deliver results within half an hour. I think you take a few days to do that in the United Kingdom. We have big issues with, with testing. And this is part of TTIS. Test, trace, isolate, and the fourth bit is security. Ensure food security. And this is just to show that we are part of this noble, Peace Prize winners for 2020, the World Food Program, where we are a partner of WFP. And this is happening elsewhere in the Muslim world. This is Imana, North America, working with Pakistan. And this is one doctor, one doctor making a difference in Sudan, Dr. Omar, who's an Egyptian, with his team from White Hearts. And this is them in Yemen. And these are our young doctors in Tanzania. These ladies and children, you have never seen a doctor probably in their whole life until our, our Islamic Medical Association of Tanzania went across. See, young people, yeah? Young people, this is my chief coordinator. I am, uh, well, well, I'm the advisor. And if you look at, um, We, we have to make the voice of the Muslim felt, yeah? So we were on television, right? And this video of mine was hitting something like, well, I was like a pop star, man, three million and, and climbing. And now what else? Yeah, I think that's the first bit as an introduction. Thank you very much, sister.
No problem. Please carry on. Uh, I thought there was a question that, 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 that this will be a second part. You want me to continue? Um, if you're happy to. Unless... No, I think I, I will leave this for the second part of the question. Okay, so um, Dr. Mohammed Khan, are you happy to, to speak? Yes, for sure. I'll just, uh, Salaam Alaikum. I'll just uh, turn my camera on and share my screen if that's okay. Right. How does that look if I full screen myself? Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, Jazakallah khair for having me here. My name is uh, Dr. Khan. I'm a respirologist here in Toronto. Uh, so I have the opposite uh, issue as Professor Nuruddin, where it's, uh, I guess, the early morning, uh, Sunday morning over here for us. So. Um, so I was asked to speak about what Canada has been doing in terms of our response uh, and um, uh, you know, talking about the Canadian Muslim COVID task force and, and sort of what our experiences have been. I've got no disclosures and, and we'll quickly go over some of the uh, different things that we'll address inshallah today. Um, so we developed the Canadian Muslim COVID-19 task force, which essentially came together in um, on March the 12th, 2020. And this was a day before uh, the national lockdown uh, was announced here in Canada. And uh, we sort of established ourselves um, because of concerned community members who contacted myself and some other uh, healthcare professionals as part of the Muslim Medical Association of Canada, uh, as well as the Canadian Council of Imams, just you know, asking about what's this we're hearing about this pandemic and this virus that's in the States and the UK and Europe and the rest of the world, and do we have to be concerned? And you know, a lot of us had been following it for a number of months by then, and we said, yeah, actually, we do have to be concerned. And so we sort of made a brave and bold call uh, before a lot of the other countries that actually were having second waves to actually suspend uh, Juma and Friday prayers. And, and we made that call late in the Thursday night. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, Friday morning when a lot of, um, you know, both mosques and, and as well as uh, uh, Muslims woke up, uh, they were a bit astounded in terms of what we did. And so we sort of uh, started there and then built from there onwards. And we have sort of you know, three main arms within which we operate. We have the medical or the health arm, and there's a whole lot, a lot of initiatives that we sort of, uh, uh, you know, were involved with. So uh, like the UK and many other countries, a lot of uh, Canadian Muslims are frontline healthcare workers as well as essential workers as well. Um, we, you know, developed uh, and established WhatsApp groups to help facilitate communication. There were a lot of advocacy petitions that a lot of our physicians and healthcare workers were involved in, whether it was advocating for border control and closures, especially with the United States, um, which is, uh, you know, we have the longest unmanned uh, border uh, in the world with, between Canada and the United States, and they had much higher rates of infections, as many of us know. Uh, we were advocating for uh, smaller gathering sizes that the governments weren't ready to, uh, to push. Uh, and we were also advocating for uh, loosening of testing criteria, where initially it was just for patients who might have had certain symptoms and trying to push for asymptomatic testing as much as possible. So Alhamdulillah, a lot of Muslim physicians sort of led that front and we were able to um, enforce change that way. We developed a lot of guidelines as well for the Canadian Muslim community here in Canada. So when it comes to palliative care and diff life care, uh, developing infection control uh, policies for a lot of the organizations that sort of came together to help each other out and, and as well as help deliver food packages and supplies to uh, individuals who might have been isolating or under quarantine or just, you know, on, on lockdown. Uh, and uh, as well as some guidelines for, um, you know, families that have individuals who have disabilities uh, and, and care or caregivers as well. So we try to have an equity lens to everything that we've done. Uh, and you know, we felt that it was quite important to also support, you know, physicians who were at the front lines as well. Now, certainly our wave and our first wave was certainly not as bad as it has been in many other countries around the world, but there was still this need uh, to support physicians from a mental standpoint. So there were weekly uh, seminars where it was only, uh, you know, staff or what you call consultant physicians who would, uh, you know, meet uh, on an evening and just discuss what their fears were, what their concerns were. 
um, we developed and we opened it up to not just Canadian Muslims, but all uh, you know Canadians. We had internal medicine, emergency, uh, um, as well as ICU refresher courses that we set up. Uh, and we opened it up to everyone uh, based on what we were seeing in New York and Italy, uh, where people had to be pulled in from the community to sort of, you know, help with uh, help in the acute care setting. Um, we didn't have to necessarily do that, uh, at least in the first wave, and we're, we might be looking at that in the second wave right now. Uh, but it was, you know, very well received uh, by the wider Canadian community as well. Uh, and then, you know, like the many other, uh, uh, you know, international Muslim organizations here, including BIMA, we had a lot of national and international media presence. Uh, you know, Canadian Muslims are actually uh, come from all over the world. Uh, and so we couldn't just disseminate our materials in just English. And so we had to disseminate it in French, given that, you know, we're a bilingual country officially, but also had to, uh, we had to disseminate materials in Arabic and Urdu, as well as Pashto Bengali, and we're working on establishing that more as well. And then a lot of our physicians and, and healthcare workers were also working on things like contact tracing apps and, and uh, unique masks that were being developed as well. So that was just the medical arm. And then from the religious arm, you know, we had to establish guidelines uh, to help our masajid sort of uh, navigate the space when it comes to, you know, how do we adjust what we're doing, uh, you know, within our uh, mosques and our communities um, as the situation changes, you know, as we've realized and we've seen the situation is always in flux and it's changing, you know, month by month. And, you know, we're a big country, so it, it varies region by region and, 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 and province by province. And so we had to establish guidelines that, uh, you know, for our mosques that weren't necessarily reflected in the regional and provincial guidelines that the government was putting out. Most of those were targeted towards, you know, mainly the, um, you know, churches and the Christian community. And there was very little guidance for some of the unique exposures and risks and, and things that we had to consider uh, for our uh, community. So we sort of established those and released those as well. We held webinars uh, to try and help educate the general public as well as the masajid. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's the same thing in the UK, but uh, at least here in Canada, all the uh, mosques operate in silo. Uh, they, uh, they're not connected to each other. Uh, we don't have one unifying body that sort of dictates and tells uh, all the masajid in the mosque what to do. So, and there was no way of contacting them all either. So we had to sort of establish uh, you know, a, a national uh, mustard database where uh, we could, you know, disseminate our materials quickly, but also involve them in the process, uh, get their feedback. And we actually did this in, uh, uh, just because of the pandemic, we were able to do it in a way where we also uh, brought people from coast to coast and mosques from coast to coast, um, but also regardless of sect. So there were uh, Sunni Shias, uh, Ahmadis, uh, you know, um, Ismailis, people from all different sects of uh, Islam also represented. And, and we sort of maintained that in terms of our approach, in terms of who we're advocating for, which is all Canadian, uh, uh, you know, who identify as being Muslim. And then, you know, we also had to, um, you know, within our, our mosque, we sort of advocated for things as the medical evidence and the literature was sort of developing, as we saw that the evidence, for example, masking was there, the evidence for you know, contact tracing was necessary within these settings. We pushed these through directly and straight to our Masajid in the mosques, even before governments and, and uh, public health has sort of mandated it uh, within our province and the regions. And so that was actually quite well received when there were, for example, spot checks at our houses of worship because there have been outbreaks at uh, churches and, and, and in other uh, houses of worship in the context of funerals and, and weddings. But Alhamdulillah, uh, at, at our mosques, uh, we've had positive cases arrive, but we haven't had any outbreaks per se because we were sort of trying to uh, do things in advance. And then from the community perspective, you know, we focused a lot on messaging and, uh, you know, trying to establish reach uh, because a lot of individuals may not have been able to, you know, watch TV at one o'clock when the premier might speak or understand what uh, is being discussed. Some of the discussions are very high level or scientific. So we had social media campaigns, we had infographics that we had developed that were culturally sensitive and and were applicable for the Muslim community that was digestible. We tried to use, uh, you know, video webinars and Q&A sessions and town halls. And then the community, we did a whole host of things that I think were also occurring uh, across the world as well in terms of PPE drives for massages as well as hospitals, food drives, like I mentioned, uh, for not just healthcare workers, but also community members who are alone at home. Something that was new and unique for us was in a lot of cities in Canada, we were able to broadcast the Azan for the first time during Ramadan every single day at Maghrib for wow. a couple of minutes. Yeah. 
And this was something that was novel. It was pushed by the, um, you know, a lot of our Muslim um, politicians and uh, council members that we have, because while we were able to, you know, while, as you might recall in Ramadan, which was during the first wave for many of our countries, we had to spend it indoors and we couldn't, you know, have Tarawih and, and Tahajjud, et cetera, at the Masjid. So as a way of trying to get buy-in, uh, we got the mayors from all the big cities uh, across Canada or the majority of them to be able to allow for a five minute Azan, uh, which was never heard of. And yes, there was, you know, um, you know, other groups that were targeting us and were saying, well, what if we were having, you know, Azan, uh, you know, being broadcast, why not uh, everything else? But for the most part, it was okay. actually well received. I'm just going to stop you there, though, yeah. just because um, I just want to stick with the first theme then about raising the awareness of the work that you've done. And then Great. we'll come back to this, if you don't mind, um, for the second question. Um, and then if I ask um, Professor Ihsan. Okay, so, yes, please. So yes, so if you could please elaborate on how um, in Turkey, how you've raised awareness of the work um, of Muslim healthcare professionals and how they've engaged in COVID. Okay. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Assalatu Assalamu Ala Sayyid Al Mursaleen. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank uh, to British Islamic Medical Association and uh, the organizing committee for giving me this wonderful opportunity to address my British Muslim sisters and brothers. And I would like to warmly salute uh, my brothers and sisters, the audience on behalf of Federation of Islamic Medical Association and on, uh, on my own behalf. Uh, the task uh, given to me uh, today uh, is uh, talking about... Perfect, thank can you, you, can you see? Yes, can lovely. You see now? Okay. If you just expand uh, though, that would be brilliant. Yes, okay. Thank just you. A minute. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the task uh, given to me for today's uh, webinar is uh, talking about the FEMA's role and perspective and uh, showcasing a tangible example. Uh, about unity during a global pandemic. And uh, I would like to give a brief information about FEMA before going uh, into the details of my presentation. Established in 1981, FEMA, Federation of Islamic Medical Association, is a registered body of uh, 55 Islamic medical associations and uh, associates from 50 countries from all over the world. And currently it embraces over 50,000 healthcare professionals worldwide. The main mission and aim of FEMA, the Federation of Islamic Medical Association, is to provide a platform for Muslim health healthcare workers worldwide through medical education, research, and ethics, and also through student activities, especially international medical student camps, uh, providing humanitarian and medical relief to some affected areas, regions, and communities, and also to promote the understanding and application of Islamic principles in the field of medicine, in our field, and uh, last but not the least, to foster the unity and welfare of Muslim medical and healthcare professionals. FEMA is a not-for-profit, non-political and non-governmental organization. And the audience can uh, reach uh, some more details through uh, FEMA's website, which is addressed as femaweb.net. When we uh, reached to the new year 2020, uh, we didn't know that it would be a COVID-19 year, but unfortunately, uh, this truth uh, that came true. And uh, beginning from the first days of the pandemic, uh, as a responsibility uh, coming from its mission uh, and vision, FEMA uh, has started to take initiative uh, and uh, the executive committee of FEMA uh, held online periodic meetings 
to coordinate all the activities of FEMA all over the world. And we, uh, we held these meetings, the executive committee meetings, very frequently in the first phase of the pandemic. And also we, uh, we have held uh, some global uh, FEMA Council, FEMA General meetings uh, two times, twice during this pandemic period. And uh, 23 from 23 countries, 60 members of IMAs uh, participated in this meeting. Those meetings uh, was about the coordination and cooperation uh, and the evaluation of the COVID-19 situation among FEMA member countries and to coordinate FEMA initiatives and activities. And we have exchanged ideas uh, among the member countries. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we have prepared an informative text uh, re referring to the legacy of Islamic history. This text was prepared and written by our uh, chair of FEMA Advisory Council, Professor Musa Mohammed Nordin, with the help of his daughter, uh, Dr. Husna Musa, and he reminded all of us that today's pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, is neither unusual nor unprecedented. Because when we look into the details of our Islamic history, we would see uh, many similar uh, examples. And he uh, recalled again the famous hadith, uh, we can say prophetic call for quarantine. If you hear of an outbreak of plague in a land, do not enter it. But if the plague breaks out in a place while you are in it, do not leave that place. And uh, he referred to the many plagues throughout the history in the Islamic wars, world. And he uh, of, again recalled us uh, during those plagues, sometimes the mosques, mosques were closed and the Adhan was stopped. And he uh, made references uh, to some uh, Islamic ulama in the past like Imam Zahabi, Al-Makrizi, and Ibn Hajar, Al-Asqalani. After that, uh, after yani, preparing uh, the community, the Islamic community, ready for these restrictions and some other uh, lifestyle changes, changes due to the pandemic, some informative documents uh, prepared and distributed widely to the member countries by the FEMA leadership, as, like as guidelines, recommendations, infographics, flyers, posters. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to pass back to Professor Musa, if that's OK, for him to, to share, though, um, how they managed um, the effects of COVID in the community from an institutional and political perspective. Is that OK? So we can compare? Yeah, whatever you like. Thank you. Right. Can I share the screen, please? Yes, please go for it. All right, let me see. Okay, this 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 is part two, um, and trying to answer some of the concerns of uh, Sister uh, Madiha. Now, I think extremely important that one of the pivotal tasks is to ensure that our funding is sustainable. Yeah, and this is where we have to engage with 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 the youth really. And this group of ladies from Fashion Valley, they are influencers. They got five million supporters, so we raise uh, a few million with them. Yeah, and using new technology, that's one. Number two, I think we need to build trust with the community. We need to build partnership, and not just working within our. Our, our Muslim fraternity, but engaging with everyone out there. This is just one example, the Malaysian Pediatric Association. We were all over Malaysia raising money and buying stuff that's required by our frontliners. And not only that, we must always think about the marginalized, the impoverished. This is us running clinics, ongoing without fail for our refugees. We've got about 175,000 refugees in Malaysia. And this is working with other 
relief agencies, yeah, mobile clinic that goes out into the communities. Who are these guys? These are drug dependent guys. We, 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 we got them on board and they were the ones that were, that was teaching the PPEs for us. And here we acknowledge them as partners in our COVID work, yeah. And this is working with our brothers all over the world. I attended the webinar with Kenya. Look at that. They're having a difficult time. They actually exceeded United Kingdom in terms of um, uh, tests that were positive. There was 15%. The good countries like Malaysia is doing 3%. You need to be below 3 United Kingdom then was something like 10%. And using the right tools, I'm still hammering at the Minister of Health to make sure that they use the the, the, the rapid test, you can get results within half an hour at ground zero, at the point of care, but they are still at demon with using this old school PCRs. And Dr. Dr. Uh, Esan has mentioned that work goes on, life goes on. We must not allow our lives to be colored and monopolized by COVID. We have to continue with our work, with our council meetings, and this is me addressing the youth, the doctors in, in, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, the future of healthcare, right? And look at this, they are really fired up. This is in, in the camp that was in, uh, in, um, uh, in, in Turkey, yeah? This is, this, is, this is very sentimental to me because this is when we got the girls out with us in the outdoor camps. So really getting the young involved in this work, yeah? This is our legacy. And as I mentioned to you, continue to write because we need the science out there. This is our encyclopedia, which I am the chief editor, uh, Dr. Khaldun in Bangladesh there, and Dr. Wajid, Dr. Sharif in, in Bima. Look at, that's our president there. And of course, this was mentioned by Wajid. The program continues. We still need to save lives. Guys who get strokes, guys with infarcts, you know, which we need to, to save. This is the last bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, if I go back then to you, um, Dr. Hashim. That's for sure. Zakullah khair. Thank you. And I'm just amazed at the efforts. Absolutely astounded. Thank you. All right. So I'll go full screen again. So I'll just talk about some of the experiences and lessons learned that we had based on a number of the different initiatives that we had. So in terms of what worked, uh, one of the good things that we did was, and, and a lot of the other um, faith-based task forces that do exist in Canada, so for the Jewish communities and, and, and you know, now the newly formed Hindu and Sikh communities that we were actually able to spawn and, and kickstart a few weeks ago in the context of Diwali. Um, you know, our, our um, makeup is a bit different. So we actually have, like I said, both physicians and healthcare professionals, but also community leaders and community organizations. And also we have um, you know, our religious leaders and imams as well. And that sort of approach has actually worked quite well for us because uh, it's given us a holistic and intersectoral approach towards all the issues that we sort of, you know, come to our attention and then that we're tackling. And because, you know, the task force is not really under one organization, like, yes, it was started by the, you know, Muslim Medical Association of Canada or the Canadian Council of Imams working together, but we've sort of established it without being under one organization. And what that did was it actually took away any of the organizational egos that come along with it. Um, and, you know, like many of the other organizations were also, you know, apolitical. And so this was useful because then it broke down a lot of barriers that existed between organizations. It encouraged a lot of the organizations that were previously operating in silo to start working together to, to start collaborating, sharing resources and experiences and, and actually you know, um, pooling resources together so that uh, they're not necessarily duplicating each other's efforts. Um, so this was quite helpful and beneficial for us. And, and we've actually been able to collaborate between communities more and actually reach communities that previously were not speaking to each other either. And like I said before, um, you know, we've had, Alhamdulillah so far, uh, I don't want to eat my words, but we've been okay in terms of not having any major outbreaks that have, you know, um, you know, been reflected in the news media as something that's been uh, pushed by, uh, the Muslim community, uh, but that's something that we're always very cognizant of being a, you know, minority population within uh, a non-Muslim country. And I think that's those are some of those things that are actually quite common with the, with the UK as well for the non-Muslim countries. 
And public health has always actually, whenever they've come back to us, they've actually said that our guidelines and recommendations are actually going above and beyond whatever that they're recommending and also what other houses of worship are doing as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll take that uh, pat on the back. Um, there, it wasn't perfect. You know, some things didn't work as well as as planned. So, you know, it was hard to always engage with government and decision makers. And we had some discussions about how politically active do we really want to be. Uh, but we also know that we can do whatever we want, but ultimately, uh, you know, we need decision makers and politicians and, 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 you know, those in public health to help us and move us along. So we, we try to achieve a, achieve a position where we're not, you know, protesting on the streets, but at the same time, we're trying to, you know, gently and professionally advocate for our communities. Um, as the situation changed, uh, you know, uh, before we had a national lockdown across the country, and then things started moving where now, instead of being run at the federal level, um, you know, we started seeing changes, not, the, not just at the provincial or the county level, uh, but at the regional level. And so what that happened was then, you know, you could drive 10 minutes or 15 minutes away and there would be slightly different recommendations. And so that made things a lot more complicated in terms of how do we accommodate uh, lots of different regions uh, that are neighboring each other, uh, but uh, they might have slightly different recommendations. And that certainly made our, our work challenging. COVID fatigue is certainly real, not just in the general community, but also within, you know, task forces and member organizations. Like, you know, initially there was this mad rush of everyone wants to help and, you know, March and April uh, for us when, you know, the onset of our pandemic. And then now, uh, you know, six to 10 months later, uh, you know, it's settling in in terms of, you know, some organizations or individuals might be a bit more tired. Uh, may, we can see that sometimes in, in, in terms of the attendance of some of the meetings. Uh, and that's, so we have to figure out ways to try to, you know, re-engage our communities and keep, just keep pushing through uh, for the duration of the pandemic. Funding for our nonprofit organizations and massages, as well as resource and time limitations are always an issue. Uh, and we haven't sought any funding at all uh, as of now. Uh, and we've been doing this all primarily based on, uh, you know, volunteer time and resources from all the different member organizations. The challenges that we had also were that a lot of the times, as you might've heard, we pushed things that were in advance and were a, a bit more uh, uh, ahead of what the government was stating. So, uh, we pushed for the closure of Masajid before uh, the, the government pushed it. Uh, uh, you know, it was days in advance, but it was still, it's not like much has changed. We pushed for mandatory masking uh, and implemented it before it was mandatory from a public health or from a, you know, uh, governmental level. We pushed for mandatory contact tracing and keeping registers of people who were coming in uh, to Masajid. Uh, we pushed for, you know, recognizing the second wave and reducing services in that context. So with all these things, the challenge is because is that everyone always asks, well, why are we doing something that the government isn't forcing us to do? Or why are we doing something that the government is asking us to do? And that requires, again, you know, at community education, getting buy-in, and we've sort of tried to achieve that by having our community members, our leaders, having our mosque have a seat at the table. So they feel like that decision is being made with them being included as well. And that helps us get buy-in as well. And then it doesn't help, and we've seen this, I think, across many countries where when you have inconsistent messaging from politicians and from government and public health, that causes a lot of confusion. And when things are changing very quickly and very rapidly, then it's hard for everyone to keep up with the messaging, let alone them even reaching and getting the messaging either. And then lastly, uh, you know, enforceability, you know, we're a task force, which is a whole bunch of Muslim organizations that have come together, but at the end of the day, we don't write the laws. So people might, people who are looking for uh, you know, loopholes might say, well, you can't force us to do this, so we're not going to. So without, uh, you know, besides having our own internal uh, regulation that we have where, you know, if we had a smaller mosque that may not have been, for example, implementing or observing the public health rules, not even ours, but public health rules, we would get our own local imams on the task force to call them up and, and you know, uh, just have a quick chat with them uh, before it would go into the public space. And that internal regulation seemed to work quite well and was quite effective. Uh, and then finally, representation, you know, we're a very big country. And like I said, we represent many different communities. Uh, you know, while we do have uh, several different communities represented, you know, South Asians, you know, Arab Muslims, and, you know, now Somali Muslims as well, uh, we do need to do a better job of representing all Canadian Muslims and as well as from all across the, uh, the country, not just in our most populous uh, uh, provinces. So we're always working to, you know, maximize that, inshallah. 
Thank you. I'm just going to, um, I'm sorry, I know this is the third no, question, no, no. but I'm just going to pass back to Professor Isan because I'm acutely aware that I didn't give him enough time in the first question either. Um, it's great to see the themes of proactiveness and um, if you can just elaborate on that, Professor Isan, and just share the insights on how um, FEMA are managing the effects of COVID and also the contributions that BEMA have had in leading the international response. Thank you. May I share the slides, my slides again? Yes, please. Is it okay now? Perfect. Floor's okay. all yours. So after uh, giving uh, reference to the uh, our glorious history uh, about uh, in regard to the pandemics, uh, FEMA leadership has prepared some informative documents. Uh, if I want to give uh, an example list of these documents, uh, those were, were COVID-19, peak of epidemics, Islamic medical jurisprudential guidelines, during the COVID uh, pandemic, guidelines for patients during Ramadan, uh, uh, Ramadan rapid review and recommendations mainly uh, prepared by BIMA, British Islamic Medical Association, and uh, widely distributed uh, by FIMA leadership to the member countries. Smart lockdown for mosques and madrasa, FIMA statement on safe Ibadah, Islamic burial guidelines for deceased body of COVID-19. Those are some examples from uh, prepared documents by FEMA leadership, uh, like flyers, posters, infographics. Uh, this is uh, one example of uh, a guideline about patients during Ramadan. And those are uh, examples of posters and flyers. When we uh, look into it, uh, we reminded three hadiths to reflect, for example, and then uh, our infographics uh, was for Muslim individuals, for Muslim communities, for mosques and madrasas, and uh, some other informative infogra infographics uh, distributed uh, among member countries. Uh, there was a, a, a campaign which is called Ramadan at Home, uh, mainly started uh, by uh, Muslim Council of Britain and uh, BIMA, and uh, BIMA accepted and endorsed and uh, widely distributed this uh, campaign among member countries. And it's uh, the flyer, the poster said, this Ramadan will be different, but it need not be dangerous. Uh, stop the spread of COVID-19 and keep our communities safe. And as I said before, uh, this uh, campaign uh, was started by uh, Muslim Council of Britain and uh, BIMA, British Medical Associations, and uh, they uh, reminded the Muslim community there was no congregation, congregational prayer during that different Ramadan, no terawis uh, at home, iftars at home, and they recommended virtual iftar using online video facilities among the family members or uh, among uh, beloved ones. Uh, after that, we reached to the Eid al-Fitr and uh, under the lockdown circumstances, and also we have uh, distributed these uh, posters, how to celebrate Eid al-Fitr at home. Uh, there were uh, some uh, problems arised, matters arised uh, among the Muslim minority countries or uh, Islamic countries. One of them was uh, in Sri Lanka. And the Muslim community in Sri Lanka warned us about a, a blanket rule of the uh, government of Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka about the uh, cremation of all dead bodies of COVID-19. And they applied this rule uh, for Muslim minority as well. And uh, FEMA leadership prepared a letter and sent to the prime minister of Sri Lanka uh, requesting to abandon cremation of dead bodies for Muslim minority, which is totally against Islamic principles, as you know. Another uh, problem uh, matter arise in Pakistan about the congregational prayers and FIMA leadership again prepared and sent letters to, to the president, prime minister, and Senate members of Islamic Republic of Pakistan uh, requesting suspending congregational prayers all over Pakistan. And these are the uh, examples of those letters sent to the politicians and the political leaders. On the other hand, uh, Simco, which is uh, a branch uh, a project of uh, FEMA, 
uh, and the title is uh, Consortium of Islamic Medical Colleges, started and continued uh, to um, carry out online seminars during this pandemic. And uh, during these online seminars, the current scientific data on COVID-19 uh, was shared with the audience and experiences in different countries uh, came from the uh, well-known speakers on a multidisciplinary basis. Again, Muslim Council of Britain and British Islamic Medical Association uh, prepared a template Friday khutbah about the potential second wave and protecting our families from this disaster. And FEMA accepted and uh, uh, distributed this uh, template khutbah to the member uh, IMAs uh, to read during the Juma prayers. And uh, the latest issue of FEMA yearbook, which is a very uh, important encyclopedia uh, of uh, FEMA, uh, dedicated totally to the pandemic, uh, the latest issue. And uh, the, the general uh, title, the main topic was Islamic and health challenges in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, anyone who wants uh, to reach the uh, content of this FEMA yearbook uh, can do that very easily through FEMA website, uh, which I mentioned, femaweb.net. And I would like to thank especially to those two gentlemen about the preparation uh, of uh, FEMA COVID-19 posters and flyers. On the left side, is uh, Professor Musa Mohammed Nordin from IMA Malaysia, who is the chair of FEMA Advisory Council as well. And our brother, Dr. Mohammed Wajid Akhtar from British Islamic Medical Associations. Um, um, they spent very, uh, yani very great efforts to uh, prepare these posters and flyers. May Allah accept from them and from their team. And at the end of my uh, talk today, I would like uh, to uh, make this dua and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will bring this pandemic to a prompt conclusion and that he will protect us from the scourges of COVID-19 and that he will ease us in our daily duties to seek his pleasure. Jazakumullah khairan kaseera. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is absolutely fabulous. And I feel so sorry to have each individual point to cut um, all of you off. It's just that I think that this is testament to the amount of work that's been done. And 45 minutes is not enough at all um, for us to be able to say everything that you have done. So one minute each, please, for you all to finish up and give us a recap. And then we will move to the announcements. So, Professor Musa. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll have to do a bullet train then. Uh, there you are. This is us right from the time when we only had 28,000 cases and now we're something like, what, 28 million? This is all FEMA's work. We just put on the FEMA logo and distributed it to 50 different countries. Kudos to the young guys and girls in, in FEMA. Look at that. Excellent work. Excellent uh, infographics. Yeah, and this is me, yeah, uh, putting it on Twitter, and I told our muftis about this, and they, 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 they embraced, embraced it. And this is me speaking to Imran Khan on Twitter, and this is me again speaking to Jokowi in Indonesia, two of the largest countries in terms of population. And this is me trying to work with the former Prime Minister of Malaysia to raise funds to help our brothers in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Philippines, this is Sister Aisha in Indonesia. We help them as well. This is us helping with our brothers in the Gaza Strip. Appeal for them. Noting that they have a terrible winter, helping with the clothes as well. Helping with our brothers in Gaza, Lebanon, Turkey. And this is us. We've done very well. When we mean us, it's Asia, Africa, Oceania. Look at South America, North America. Lousy leadership. Sorry, guys. And there you are, this is all the superheroes paying respect to our frontliners, the doctors, the healthcare workers, the nurses, the ambulance driver, amazing group of people, may Allah bless them. This is what Wajit was talking about, resilience, yeah? Not only must we be solid, we must be Muslim. 
good in ourselves and giving back to society. Um, the best amongst you is the one who is the best to his community. Uh, this is the, well, I'm Superman here in this hospital. And unfortunately, we have to remember the ones that have, that have left us, who have sacrificed their life for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. Yeah? Zakumullah khair. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. I'm speechless. That was absolutely amazing. Um, and over to you, um, Dr. Khan. One minute. Bullet train, as Professor Musa said. Zakumullah <laughs> khair. I'm going to share my screen if I can. I think Professor Nurdin has to stop sharing the screen first, I think. Uh, okay, Zakumullah khair. No, that's fine. I can't share my screen, but that's okay. It's just a minute, so that's fine. Um, so, you know, we've, we've certainly learned a lot from, you know, what BIMA has been doing because, uh, you know, in the UK, your, your second wave and, and even the first wave has sort of preceded what we've been seeing here in Canada. And we've had the luxury of seeing what's happened around the world to be able to sort of predict what's going to happen in the future and anticipate some of those challenges. And um, in that regard, it's helped us prepare a lot as well. So I think uh, you know, from the pandemic as well, we've been uh, communicating with, uh, you know, Dr. Wajid and, 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 and Bima, as well as Imana in the States and other, uh, you know, Muslim task forces and other Muslim minority countries. And it's been quite beneficial in, in a sense that we have a lot of shared challenges and experiences, although we have our own individual context. So, and I, and I hope that we continue to, you know, uh, you know, share our resources and experiences. And then also after this pandemic, inshallah, that you know, we continue such collaborations even post the pandemic uh, to try and embody the unity within the Ummah that, you know, we're supposed to have. And, you know, so in that regard, I wanted to thank, um, you know, Bima. And, you know, as we look towards the horizon, which is where we have, you know, vaccines now, at least here in the UK, and then being rolled out across the world, in the coming months, there's a lot of a role, there's a big role that, you know, um, Muslim organizations and, and Muslim medical organizations have to play in terms of maximizing the uptake and making sure that it's safe. And it's something that we're all in agreement with. And I think there's a lot of discussions that and questions that people have. So inshallah, we can all continue to work together and, and do what is best for our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is the bit that everyone's been waiting for in that we've had three intense sessions and we've all learned so much. And I'm sure the takeaway messages that hopefully you're tweeting are filling the internet. But now is the bit, the boring and the bit with the announcements. So we are going to be going to a break. Um, so before we go to the break, I just want you to make sure that you do fill in the feedback, um, the feedback forms. So if you can get tech savvy and do the scanning with that QR code, go ahead. If not, follow the link, which is www.bitly forward slash feedback NC20 and is case sensitive. So make sure N and C are in capitals. Um, and if you want to get in contact with Beamer, there's multiple ways that you can. So get in contact with Beamer either by email info at britishima.org or using um, Twitter or Instagram. And thirdly, so this is to warn you that we are basically, we want to, we're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign because as you've just seen, those efforts are phenomenal. FEMA, BEMA, we're working together to deliver such change on a scale that I personally feel is quite un is unprecedented from such a small organization. So we need resource. And so our finance team are crowdfunding to get some resource, some financial resource. So do look out for that. Um, and these are just examples of some of the campaigns that we will be using the resources for, operation, vaccination, and we need another form of resource. We need you, we need manpower. We need you to come and join the Beamer team, be that tree that Brother Waja described, and perhaps you might even make it into Professor Musa's um, cartoon infographics in the future, you never know. So um, look at the Beamer website, check it out. And if you're not already a member, join Beamer. <laughs>